All right, awesome. Are we all here? Can you all hear me? All right, great. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and, and get started for the day. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining in uh, to our own cinematography webinar. Um, we are calling this the uh, How to Get Paid to Travel uh, with Your Drone. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, questions and inquiries um, over time about this exact you know, topic. And of course, we're very passionate about um, giving away value, giving away knowledge, um, especially for those who have uh, you know, been able to travel the world and um, see some of the amazing things, amazing places drone um, can take it. So before we get um, too into it, yes, if you are not speaking, I'm going to ask if you could please get the microphone. And I may have to meet you. Okay. So, All right, appreciate it, appreciate it. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, if you do have a question, feel free, of course, to um, at any time, uh, you know, reach out, uh, put your uh, questions in the chat, and then of course we're gonna have a Q and A session at the end uh, for all questions to be answered. So we want to make sure everyone gets as much value out of here um, uh, as we can. All right. So let me just bring up a few slides just to get us started off, and then uh, we're going to get right into this session for the day. All right, so I um, just wanted to do a quick um, intro uh, for those who may not know um, who I am, and uh, maybe this is your first time interacting with uh, Global Air U, um, but my name is Eno. Um, I am uh, originally born in, in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I am uh, Nigerian, um, also by uh, way of my, my father and my family. And, um, you know, through the years, I've been able to uh, build uh, the Global Air uh, brand um, to um, a number of different countries. We've, we've done uh, trainings and workshops all over the world. Um, but what's most important to me is, you know, sharing um, our experiences and sharing the things um, that we've gone through, you know, over the years. Um, as many of you are looking into drones as a business, as a career, um, it's not just about, you know, um, getting the technical skills and hoping that that's going to be enough, right? Um, there's a whole business, um, you know, behind how you uh, uh, get more employees, how you create leads, how you um, are nurture those leads, and eventually how you provide an offer uh, to close, you know, on these leads. So what we do is we go more, much more in depth than um, just, you know, teaching you how to fly. Um, we actually teach you how to create a business and, and a successful thriving business um, as well. Um, so just quickly, I will go into a little bit more of my story because, you know, obviously very relevant to today's topic. Um, but just to give you a, an insight on who we are as a company, it's actually a group of uh, brands um, under one umbrella. So we first started out as Global Air Media, and uh, Global Air Media is a for-profit entity. Uh, we started in 2015, and it was because we saw that there was a lot of um, opportunity um, in the drone space. And we said, all right, let's, um, let's get in on the ground floor. We didn't want to be one of those kind of you know, left behind um, when everyone was first talk, starting to talk about drones. So um, I found out about drones. Actually, my first interaction experience was in Nigeria. I was actually visiting some family there and I saw a drone um, flying at a, at a stadium at an outdoor event. And I was just so captivated, um, you know, by the technology. Uh, it really just, you know, blew me away. And I said, this is absolutely, you know, what I want to do. Uh, so I came back um, at the time I was in the States, you know, full time. I did a lot of research and I found all the different industries that drones uh, would be used in. And it was at that point where I said, you know what, this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, this is my true calling. And uh, essentially went and got the license. Uh, we started doing some um, different jobs around uh, Baltimore and, and gained some traction. And then we realized that the industry really wasn't going to grow at the pace we wanted to unless more people you know, understood about drones and, and uh, provided the, the avenue to, to educate these people. So we created the Global Air Drone Academy, uh, which is our nonprofit. 
And we've now used uh, that nonprofit to serve thousands and thousands of students across the world, uh, teaching young kids about drone technology, how to build drones, how to fly them, and eventually how to become a professional pilot. So that's on the nonprofit side. And now we have Global Air University, uh, which is our training academy for adults. Um, we, saw that, we saw that we needed something uh, distinct, something concrete, so really people could understand uh, the value that we're bringing to adults as well. So that's a quick um, overview. Um, of course, there's a lot more you know, to my story, um, but you know, that's why we're here, to um, you know, give you all of our experiences and hopefully uh, provide you with some value so you can now go out and um, increase uh, everything that you're doing as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and stop there. Of course, uh, we're joined by very special guests uh, today who happens to be uh, my brother as well. Um, but we have Ime uh, Umo with us, um, uh, joining us uh, from his travels, recent travels. And uh, yeah, Ime, just uh, say hello to the people and uh, introduce yourself. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Eno, and I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you all so much for joining in. Thank you for this opportunity for me just to talk about my story. Um, just looking at the gallery right now, just seeing, you know, people calling in from all parts of the world. It's just really exciting to be a part of this movement where, you know, creatives are turning into entrepreneurs and, you know, people are just finding different ways to grow their business by way of drones. Um, so a little bit about myself. My name is Ime. Uh, just like in Nambang, I was born in Baltimore, um, raised Nigerian. I've always had um, a, just a piece of creativity with me always. When I was growing up, my dad would always take lots and lots of still pictures of us and print them out. So I was always um, around photography. I was always around uh, pictures and videos and uh, big shout out to my dad. He always had a way of sort of capturing us. So I was exposed early on. Um, Lived in Baltimore for some time, uh, went to school there, went to UMBC, graduated. Um, and I didn't go right into drones. I actually went into corporate America and worked for about nine years in tech as a project manager. Had a chance to work with some really cool projects all over the world, everything from system implementation to change management um, to, to tool development. Um, and I had a chance to, again, work with some really cool companies around the world, Expedia, Lenovo, Dropbox, Facebook, are all um, companies that I had a chance to um, really use my skill set of project management, people management. Um, everything was going great until I got to this point in 2018 where I just really looked around and I really, you know, asked myself, is what I'm doing right now ultimately making me happy every day? And um, that was a time for me just to be honest with myself. And at that time, it was no. Um, so I did what any smart person would do. I packed up all of my belongings. I put it in storage in California, and I started traveling the world. And I was originally supposed to travel for about three months, and now it's about four years uh, this November. So um, with that being said, I wanted to travel the world, and I just wanted to share my travels, and I wanted to share pictures and photos. So I bought a $200 DJI uh, Osmo Pocket, and I bought a drone. And my goal was just simply to share my journey with my friends and family on Facebook and Instagram. What eventually ended up happening was the more I shared, the more I started getting inquiries for, you know, people to actually um, hire me to, to come um, and do aerial photography, aerial videography. Um, so it's really, uh, my, my, my journey with Jones is really looking at it as a hobby, something I just love to do very leisurely, very casually. And the more I share my work online, uh, the more I started to get, to get hit up. And that's really, really just created a way for me to, to create a business, to run a business, and to also travel the world. So um, most of the time when I'm traveling nowadays, where, wherever you see me, whether I'm being Zimbabwe or South Africa, Kenya, Egypt, wherever it is, I'm usually there because somebody has uh, paid or paid for my creative services, paid my agency, my company to go and create content or create a marketing, uh, a marketing video um, or to capture content so that they can share their stories. So um, my, uh, just like I'm sure everyone here, everyone has their drone story, whether it be your first crash or your first job or your first really great picture that you are proud of. Um, my story is, is a little bit unconventional in terms of getting into the business, but um, now in my career, outside of creating uh, videos and stories, 
Um, it's really about giving back. So again, looking at the phone call today, seeing people from around the world, I get questions in my DM all the time about how to fly drones, what's the best equipment, how do I travel? So I'm really happy that I'm able to be here with my brother today and just talk um, and share the knowledge and share that valuable knowledge with you know future entrepreneurs, drone pilots and creatives that, that wanna know more about how to use this really valuable tool and, and hopefully how to tell better stories. So again, Edel, thank you for having me here today and I look forward to, uh, to building this uh, cohort with you. Yeah, much, much appreciated. And um, obviously, there's a, a ton of value and, and experience that you had um, really in your, you know, uh, short four five years. I mean, imagine where things are going to be 10 years from now. So uh, just really exciting to see the growth. And um, as you mentioned, yeah, it's really exciting to see everyone uh, from from across the world. So if um, yeah, maybe we can uh, pop in the chat. I would like to see maybe you could just tell us where you're from, where you're calling in, where you're joining us from. Uh, I'd like to see where everyone in the world is uh, is joining us. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind, uh, wherever you're joining us from this evening, this afternoon, uh, pop in the chat and uh, yeah, we can see where everyone's from. Awesome, all right, got DC in the house. Christopher, welcome, welcome. Virginia Beach, nice. all right. East Coast is uh, represented. We got Peter from Kenya, welcome. San Diego, all the way out in Cali, Lagos, all right. B more, B more is in the building. Awesome. Welcome, welcome, Nigeria fam, Kaduna. Nice. We have Canada, nice. Charleston. All right, awesome, awesome. Miami. Okay, so we pretty much have uh, all all corners covered. So yeah, welcome, welcome again. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, please, please keep it coming. Please keep it coming. Uyo, shout out to Uyo. That's where our our family is um, originally from. So. Awesome. All right. So today, I'm um, going to go quickly through the outline of what we're going to cover today. We have a number of different topics um, that we're going to cover. And these are really topics that we felt was, um, you know, relevant uh, for you to know. But of course, there are other topics that you want to know about as well. So please, if there's anything yeah. that you don't see on this list or something that, you know, question that you have, ask, ask, ask. We're literally here to give you everything that we have today. Uh, from our experience. So first we're gonna, of course, um, we've done our, our introductions and we're gonna dive right in, you know, talking about drone cinematography. Uh, what does it mean to get paid to travel with your drone? I mean, it sounds to some of you may like a, a, a like a foreign concept, but it is something once you get the, the basics down, you can absolutely be, be doing on a normal basis. Um, we're gonna talk about camera settings, um, the best quality to get uh, the, the type of drones that we fly uh, that, that brings us success. We're going to talk about the money shots, right? I mean, everyone sees the, these nice uh, clips and uh, everyone, I'm sure, follows a few nice drone um, uh, pages, but, you know, that's not enough. We're actually going to talk about what you need to do to uh, really get that high quality and something that Ime and I talk about all the time is getting the most value out of your drone, right? You don't just buy the drone just to, you know, turn it on and just take a few photos. And you really want to get the full experience after you've paid so much money for it, right? Um, talk about video editing, uh, the pros and cons, things I've learned over the years, things Ime is learning and going through right now as well. We're gonna talk about passive income. Uh, so actually how to use drones uh, to set up a monthly, you know, uh, recurring income that you literally, as, as the name implies, passive, you don't have to do anything. You set it up once and um, uh, you, you receive income from there. Talk about accessories and traveling with your drone as well. So a lot we want to get to today. Again, um, any questions, you know, feel free to shout it out and uh, we'll get right on it. I want to just mention some of the free resources we have for you at Global Air U. Um, we do a lot of free content. We have a lot of, um, you know, things that we're actually working on that hasn't even come out yet. Um, so we're working on a number of different courses. Um, one of the things that we have is called Drone Business Mastermind. It's sort of like our coaching program. Um, and it's really built for new and existing drone pilots who, who maybe have hit sort of a plateau or maybe don't know the, the right strategy for marketing or pricing or, or really how to bring, um, you know, your company to that next level. So we have a five-week program. Emay's actually gone through the program as well. I think one or two or other are, um, our members on the call have gone through the program as well. So they can attest to the value uh, that it has as well. But 
if you're interested, we have that. Um, we have our drone guide um, uh, for beginners. Um, and we also have our pricing guide for commercial operators, um, ultimate market, marketing guide, our pre-flight safety checklist. Uh, maintenance checklist is actually coming out soon. And then we're also going to be releasing a drone cinematography, the basics, which is really going to cover a lot of the topics that we go over here today. So we're going to put it in a nice PDF format um, so you can all have and use um, at your at your leisure. Uh, sorry, just point of clarification. Um, I was actually uh, talking about the Facebook group, the Drone Business Masterminds Facebook group, which is free for everyone um, to enter. But the Drone Business Masterminds program is a paid course that we have. And then lastly, um, we have an upcoming webinar. We do want to keep going with these webinar series. Um, and I will be talking about the nine steps to building a six-figure drone business. Um, so look out for your emails and we'll go into details about that soon. All right. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is more of our classes. If you ever get are curious, um, uh, just go check out the website for more offerings. All right. I think that's, yeah, that's it for the slides. All right. So um, going to get right into it now and uh, go through some of our topics. And we want to, you know, have this um, as an open kind of discussion that we're just up here just, you know, scrolling you a bunch of slides and, and talking to. We want this to be interactive as well. So we're just going to get into it. Um, and the first topic that we're going to have and talk about today is, the title, you know, of the workshop. So it is, you know, drone cinematography, getting paid to travel with your drone. And um, before we get into like the, the, the specific topics, I just want to do a quick um, story on how I, you know, uh, became to, to be able to travel um, internationally and, and how they came about. And, and really this, this starts um, with a theme that you're going to hear us talk about a lot. Um, and generally with, with entrepreneurship, of course, it's uh, about taking risks, right? Um, it's about, you know, uh, seeing opportunities. It's about taking those opportunities and, um, yeah, being ready, you know, when the, when the results come. So this is going to go back to, whew, well, I guess the story really starts from me loving travel, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not anything that really um, came out of the blue. I mean, I've always... My father and uh, and family in Nigeria, you know, often. So really, I had the travel bug in me for for some time, right? And when I found out about drones, of course, I was also traveling at the time, and uh, that really led to my, you know, creativity of what this drone business could be. And I, I remember in the very beginning, my partner and co-founder Austin Brown. Uh, actually, my high school buddy, friend of mine, um, we were actually, you know, going back and forth with names. So what is what name sounds good? What do we like? And eventually we settled on global air media. And, um, you know, in my mind, I said, yeah, you know, global has a nice ring to it. But yeah, I actually want to bring this, you know, to fruition. So really from the from the onset, uh, from our name, we were kind of forced into, you know, being a, a being a global company. But of course, just because you call yourself global doesn't mean you're automatically going to go going to go global. So what happened was um, speed up, you know, a couple of years. Um, we had a hurricane, um, I believe it was Maria, that had recently come uh, and devastated Puerto Rico. And uh, for those of you who remember that um, hurricane, that was actually around the same time as we had hurricanes in Florida. Um, hurricanes in Texas as well, which had literally just come before the hurricane, you know, came and destroyed uh, Puerto Rico. So during that whole time, during these hurricanes, we were getting a lot of calls, um, notices for drone pods to come out and, and um, offer their services to help, you know, map, help with the devastation. And so what happened was there was so much activity and so much going on with the hurricanes that had hit Florida and, and, and Texas I knew for a fact that once this hurricane hit Puerto Rico, there wasn't going to be a whole lot of people jumping up to, you know, fly down to Puerto Rico. Enough damn in Texas and Florida. So what I did, I actually went online and I looked up tickets to Puerto Rico because I said, hey, I have a drone. 
I know that it's going to be useful for cleanup efforts. It's going to be useful for general, um, uh, you know, mapping and things like that. So I looked up tickets. The tickets were round trip was like under 300 bucks. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give this a shot. Um, I went to uh, Airbnb to look for a place. I booked a place for maybe about four or five days, not knowing the state of it or anything like that. The guy actually reached out to me and he said, man, I'm just telling you now, you know, there's no, there's no water, <laughs> there's no electricity, things are very dire down here, unless you really need to come, you know, uh, I would probably suggest otherwise. So I said, yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, I kind of knew what the situation was. I was really mentally prepared, you know, to do it. So I said, you know what, I'm going. And, um, you know, talked to some few people. Not everyone was, was totally on board with the plan, but I said, you know what, I have a good feeling about this. So I literally packed my drone. I had a, a P3, Phantom, Phantom 3, you know, at the time, put it in my big, you know, carrying case. Anyone that had a Phantom 3, you know how big these, you know, these drones were, put it in the case and showed up in Puerto Rico. Um, after I got there, I connected, you know, with my Airbnb host. He did have a car and we just, you know, loosely put together a plan to go to a few different places, capture footage. So fast forward, I was able to capture footage. I was able to connect with some local um, emergency response teams. Mm -hmm. I was able to map a few different areas. There's actually a video on our Global Air Media page. You can go and look at some of the footage that I took. And uh, provide, you know, some value, but I was able to really get that experience of what it meant to, you know, to be on the ground for an event like this. So fast forward, I'm back in Baltimore. Everything is fine. Um, a local newspaper gets wind um, of the of, of my you know trip, and I they asked if I can send them some photos you know of the trip. And I was actually connected to the the writer. He's, he he did an article on for, but sent them some photos. They ran the story. Fine, everything was good. A few weeks later, I get a call from the Smithsonian uh, in D.C. And there was an organizer for an event that they're having. And they said, you know, we really like your story. You have an awesome background. I like that the fact that you're working with students in STEM. Would you mind coming to an event that we're having? We'd like you to be a speaker. So of course, I mean, it's when he calls you to ask you to speak at an event. Yeah, I'm absolutely going. I'm in Baltimore, DC is right there. Everything made sense. So the event went very well. Everything was fine at that event was a representative from the State Department. And he came out at the event and he said, hey, I really like what you're doing. I liked everything you're talking about, about travel and STEM and entrepreneurship. Do you wanna be a part of a program for the State Department where we actually pay you to go out and teach others and talk about STEM and, and everything in between? And yeah, once that happened, of course, my answer was yes. Um, and we, you know, uh, did the initial paperwork, and eventually they're inviting me to Kyrgyzstan, to Turkmenistan, to the UK. I mean, all these amazing places just from, you know, this domino of events, you know, that happened, all right? So basically, the moral of this is don't be afraid to take risks, right? It may not make sense in the very beginning, but if you have a good feeling about it, if you've actually planned and prepared for that risky decision, Right. It may not always go right. It's not always going to go right. There are plenty of things that I've done um, over the years that I could have done differently. I should have done differently. Right. I learned a lot of lessons, but I always go back to that one decision to just buy that ticket to Puerto Rico. Right. Because otherwise we wouldn't have got a call. We wouldn't have got invited to the event and all this amazing stuff wouldn't happen. So I did want to just share that because everyone's always asking, how did you start traveling, you know, around? How did you get international? And that's literally the story, you know, that happened. So I did just want to kind of, you know, mention that uh, just so you know, I mean, it doesn't have to happen exactly like that. You know, everyone's story is different. Everyone's opportunity is different, but you have to be ready for that opportunity uh, when it comes. So with that, um, yeah, just wanted to, you know, open up the, the topics more and really, you know, uh, find out from, from Ime, uh, maybe you could just give us a quick uh, a synopsis on how you actually, what was that spark? You know, when, when, were, when did you know that, yeah, I can, I can take this international, like I'm comfortable with, with going international. What did, what did that whole 
process look like? Man, that's a really that's a really good question. So when did I realize that I could take drones and content creation and international? To be honest, man, I would probably have to go back to the end of 2019. It was August at that point. Um, I just got done, I think it was about eight months of consecutive travel. So I remember it started in Nigeria, then I went to Hong Kong, I went to Thailand, Vietnam, uh, 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 Cambodia, uh, Bali. These are all places that I actually spent um, out of my own pocket. Um, this is right after I left uh, my job. So I had a little, you know, I was budgeting. I was, I had a little pocket change, but within all of these places that I went, I would always take my drone and I would always capture um, what I'm calling B-roll. And I would always just try to share that no matter how good it was or how bad it was. I know I was just starting out. So I shared that online. And that moment that we're talking about, the moment that it actually clicked for me was in August, 2019, I had just left uh, the United States again. And I was on my way out, um, I'm going to Zambia to work for a nonprofit and create some content for them. And I remember sitting on that plane, laptop open, external hard drive there, joining my book bag. I'm sitting there editing this video for another client while on the plane to Zambia. And I remember just being present in that moment and thinking, wow, you know, I just left my job less than a year ago. Um, I've been traveling the world for about nine, 10 months, and I'm literally on a plane uh, flying across the world to create content for somebody who trusts in my work. They trust me to tell their story. So I think it was at that point, um, it was, you know, everything just, just sort of opened up for me. And you really, you know, from a strategic standpoint, you really look at how much um, content is being used nowadays, even if it's static content like stock footage, um, that can be used in movies, their TV shows. But, you know, nowadays, everybody needs content. And uh, that was the biggest kind of click for me. It's, okay, I can now create a business that can help um, add value um, in a way that can help more businesses, nonprofits, brands actually generate revenue. So that was the big uh, kind of turning point for me. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, no, and it's, you know, when you look back, you can actually, yeah, vividly remember you know, these moments where it's like, hey, this is this is real, right? This is not just something that I'm thinking about anymore. This is not just an idea in my head. Like I'm actually bringing this, you know, to fruition. And those moments are, that's what keeps you going, you know, um, uh, on this business. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, reaching out to clients, right? I want to get into a little bit more detail on what it actually takes to get out there. So when it comes to reaching out to clients, when it comes to your portfolio, Mm -hmm. And when it comes mm -hmm. to the quality of your work, like that's obviously all very important. So how did you start to improve your quality over time? Um, because it's easy just to look at, you know, YouTube and say, hey, that's really nice. But how did you actually bring yourself to that point where you're actually matching or maybe sometimes even doing better than the quality that you saw on YouTube? Yeah. So I guess the question is, how do I just continuously improve my craft? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's you know where I'm sure we got some uh, you know outdoors people or athletes or you know um, you know it, it just really comes down to practice. You know what I mean? I think for me, I was blessed with because I had you know left corporate America and I had all this free time and I was traveling the world. You know, I was just blessed with uh, an insurmountable amount uh, amount of time. So when I was in Bali, I would wake up you know seven eight a.m. I would just go out there and fly, just go out there and practice. I would wake up in Vietnam. I would just drive down to the beach and just go and practice flying my drones. So I would say the gift of time um, really helped me a lot. And it's just really about practice. It's repetition. You know, if anybody's ever flown a drone, um, and if you it, actually, if you agree with me or not, you know, if you've ever flown a drone, if you've ever played video games before, they're kind of similar. You know what I mean? They're kind of similar. You have these two joysticks. You know, you have a little bit of muscle memory going on. So. Um, just creating that practice, creating that muscle memory um, and looking at, you know, Instagram, YouTube, Vimeo, looking at um, even looking at movies and some of the drone shots there as inspiration. Right. Looking at, OK, if my drone shot's a little bit shaky now, um, what is another drone shot I could try for a new project or what are some of the new movies coming out um, that are using drones that 
that give me that cinematic feeling that I can go and create. So I think at the end of the day, man, it's all about practice. You know, you're never going to get better by just sitting back and letting your drone just sit in the garage. Uh, you really have to make that time to practice, practice your maneuvers, try different things, um, and just know that, you know, a drone is, is a tool. You know, it's a tool for you to, to paint the canvas and, and tell your story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So... Obviously, when you're first starting off, you were mentioning that, you know, there was, so you essentially, you, you went out at first and these were trips that you already essentially paid, you were, you know, paying to go on already. So you were building your portfolio at some of these amazing places. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily paid work in the beginning, right? So I do want to kind of zero in on that. I mean, one of the things that is, yeah. is very relevant and just generally in business is you have to be ready to do some work for free really to get your 100 you know, get your word out there so you, can, you maybe touch on that a little bit more about how you've actually used free work to get opportunities to travel yeah you know it, it's kind of funny man because the way that i think about it now you know even though i paid out of pocket to go on those trips to go to thailand to go to bali to go wherever and use my drone um that's actually paying for itself today, right? Because I have a portfolio, I have a content library of stock footage from Bali, from Thailand that I can now put online and continuously make money from a clip that I shot three years ago. So that's the, just from an entrepreneur's perspective, from a strategic perspective, yes, I did put out money three years ago to go on those trips, but I am able to actually run my own business um, purchase drones, even hire other people to come and shoot because I made that investment three years ago. Now, I didn't know where it would lead me. I didn't know I would be, you know, end up, you know, shooting Burner Boy in Nigeria and, and Cardi B and all of these really cool projects. But certainly at that time, I knew that I had to put in uh, a little bit of investment of my time and then the money would come. Um, and then uh, with that being said, I, I think it's certainly, you know, putting in time, doing work for free, but as you mentioned, the portfolio website. So yes, I think Instagram nowadays is, you know, Instagram nowadays for a lot of creatives and artists, that is your portfolio, right? When you're meeting somebody out in the field, you know, you know, depending on what kind of circle you're in, you know, people aren't really asking for, you know, your business card any more that much. Um, they're really, hey, let me see your work. Let me check out your Instagram. Let me check out your YouTube. So I think for me, one of the biggest lessons was making sure that I had some of my best clips ready and available, not just on Instagram, but on Vimeo, but on YouTube, um, on my own website so that people can actually see, you know, when they come to my homepage that, hey, this guy's the real deal. He's professional. He's worked on projects all over the world. And he obviously knows what he's doing. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, go with the mindset. If you're just beginning out, it's OK if you're not going to make any money off the bat. Um, one of the biggest lessons that I learned is say yes until you can say no. So say yes to all those projects. It might be a real estate project. It might be a, a, a birthday party project that may not excite you at that point. But you have to take those opportunities because you're learning at that birthday party, you're learning how to shoot people. You're learning how to shoot moving subjects in real estate. You're building your portfolio to say, hey, I can also do uh, commercial real estate um, and I can also take really good pictures and really good videos of you know, real estate and buildings, even if that's not what you want to do um, down the road. So just be open to any work. Any chance you have your opportunity to use your drone is going to be a good opportunity starting out. And of course, once you start generating and creating that work, make sure that your work has a place to live. OK, Instagram, there's a lot going on. There's people scrolling all day. It's really hard to be unforgettable nowadays. But if you have a website, if you have a home online where your content lives, you could talk about yourself, talk about what you do. I think that's going to be a really good point for you know, creative entrepreneurs and aerial cinematographers, just to make sure that people can go somewhere to see your work. Awesome, awesome. So, you know, we have quality of work. I mean, obviously, if you if you look at anyone um, who is, you know, out there who has a big following, who has traveled, you know, to many places, it's the quality, right? If you send someone your, your portfolio, if you send someone links to your past work or your Vimeo or your IG, 
want to make sure they're seeing the best possible quality that you can put out. So that does come with practice. That does come with right. really diving deep, you know, into the details. Um, the, the, the thing that makes, you know, really yeah. uh, experts in any field, it's their attention to detail, right? You don't just gloss over um, some of the things that we're going to get to, you know, in a few, but like camera settings or buying ND filters, you know, some of these things are very, very important. And they all add up onto this, you know, this product, this amazing quality product that you're able to put it out there. So we are going to talk about some of those, yes. those details, some of the must-haves, the intangibles as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, just just along with that, you know, when we're talking about, you know, what, no matter what level you are of drone pilot, whether you're brand new uh, or you're experienced or you got your drone a couple of years ago and it's just been sitting in the garage, you know, at the end of the day, you got to start somewhere. And for me, after flying, you know, on, say, maybe maybe 40 uh, commercial projects right now, I've learned a ton of lessons in the past four years. And hopefully with these kind of webinars, with these kind of, you know, guys that we're creating on behalf of Global Air, you know, uh, Global Air uh, Drone Acad uh, Global Air University, excuse me, hopefully you won't have to go through three, four years of learning, and we can condense that down to, hey, here are the, some of the lessons that I learned that really made a difference in my photos, really made a difference in how I approach some of these projects and environments, and ultimately get the best shot. At the end of the day, if you have a drone, uh, you have a, a money printing machine, um, whether it be content or whether it be doing LIDAR or whether it be doing surveying, um, it's a tool right? Just like a hammer. It could just sit there and do nothing, or you can use that hammer to build a house. Um, so hopefully what we can, what we'll be able to do with, um, you know, new experience drone policies is really give you that value. So we can cut that learning, um, that learning curve down significantly. So you can just do what you love, whether that's flying or taking videos or photos. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, getting into some of the, the, the details, as I mentioned, you know, one of the big things, of course, getting quality shots is, um, uh, the settings, the camera settings, you know, that you're using. So mm. can you touch on yeah. maybe how you approach different camera settings? How, what are you changing? Um, what are those kind of, how you approach, you know, daytime, night, yeah, what, what's your general approach to getting the best quality and with your settings? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's twofold. I think it's both, you know, you have your kind of tactical approach, what you're going to do once you're up in the air. And then, of course, before you get in the air, you have planning. And I would say for me, especially for me, trying to achieve, uh, achieve that aerial cinematography, uh, super smooth, you know, kind of movie Netflix ready shots. Um, it, 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 it really comes down to, like I said, planning. So taking into consideration weather, taking into consideration your environment, you know, the temperature. These are all things that I learned, you know, along the way. I remember going to a trip uh, in, in Bali. I, I think I stashed all of my stuff down in Changu and I had a three hour ride to North Bali. Um, and I swore, I swore I was gonna get some of the best drone shots of my life. Little did I know, um, I did not check the weather. So that three hour drive to North Bali, even though it was great, I mean, I had a great time, but it was super gloomy, super rainy. And I, I actually didn't even get to fly my drone as, as much um, as I wanted to. So tip number one, I would certainly say planning before you get to the actual camera settings. Now, if we're talking about tactical settings for cinematography, um, one of the, the key things to remember is 24 frames per second. So on a lot of drones nowadays, they give you a lot of options for different kinds of shutter speeds, whether that be 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 48, I've even seen 60 and sometimes 120, depending on the type of drone that you have. But 24 frames per second is gonna be the closest thing to Black Panther or The Woman King or uh, Black Panther 2. 24 frames per second, um, by industry definition, is the cinematic look if you want to get that look. So that's number one. Make sure your um, your uh, uh, frames per second or your FPS is set to a cinematic setting like 24 frames per second. Number two, one of the biggest things that I had to learn uh, was just composition. 
a lot of times when I just started out, I would just be so excited to be traveling to these places. I just wanted to put my drone up and fly and try to shoot this sunset. Um, but I am telling you, when I discovered the rule of thirds, I'm telling you, my drone photography, my videography, it changed overnight. And I'm not exaggerating. It literally changed overnight. The rule of thirds is essentially a composition guide um, based on our eyesight and as humans, what we pay attention to. So some of you have maybe seen this. Uh, actually, if anybody's seen the rule, rule of thirds, just put a hands up or put a thumbs up in the chat, just so I know how many people are familiar. But essentially, the rule of thirds essentially allows you to um, organize um, your composition or essentially what your drone is looking at. It divides it into um, uh, three thirds. And it really allows you as a drone pilot to really just use the world as your canvas. So that was, if not the frames per second, that was one of the biggest, biggest, biggest game changers for me was the rule of thirds. And I would say lastly, in terms of achieving uh, cinem aerial cinematic excellence, I would say is definitely paying attention to your histogram. Your histogram, it should be included on most drones or you know, kind of their camera settings. But what a histogram will do is allow you um, to make sure that you're getting the best color out of your drone. And there's a couple of ways to read this chart. We'll get into that into more detail. But if you've ever had any problems with coloring or, you know, bringing the most vibrant colors out of your drone footage, making sure that you're paying attention to your histogram, your rule of thirds, and your uh, frames per second as drone pilots, if you can accomplish those three things, it's gonna it's gonna turn your drone footage uh, from from beginner um, to certainly I would say prosumer kind of professional level um, overnight. You might be on mute, I know, but what I see looking at here is the rule of thirds. So. Um, oh, this sorry. is a great yeah. example of the rule of thirds for everybody that can see. But as you can see, each picture is split up into um, three equal uh, three equal thirds, right? Mm -hmm. So you have that left quartile, you have the center quartile, and then you have that right quartile. And again, for me, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more with, you know, in my hands-on training, but now when I put the drone up in the air, I'm looking at the landscape and I'm really trying to figure out, okay, using these rule of thirds, using these guidelines, if you will, what is the art that I wanna create? You know, what is the image that I see here? What do I want people to focus on in this shot? And you will see, if you look at any movie, any, um, even any TV show, you can turn on Netflix oh. tonight and you put an imaginary rule of thirds over that picture, you will see that subjects, um, horizon lines are usually gonna be on those rule of thirds to give you that really cinematic look. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and some some more examples uh, here, but you can see, you know, generally how how this is done. And like you said, I mean, this can drastically drastically improve uh, your shots because you just have more you have more control, right? It's like you actually know what you're doing, but I'll, you know, besides just kind of going out there and shooting, you know, aimlessly. So these are those you know uh, particulars that we. Um, that we want to bring out. So I know you specifically mentioned uh, the frame rate. Um, so you recommend 24 frames a second. Um, I know when I was first getting into, you know, the frames per second and I, I you know, was experimenting around, but there's really no reason for drones to use 60 frames or 120 frames a second, right? I mean, you're, you're typically flying so far away. Um, the drone mm -hmm. naturally has that slow, um, you know, that slow cinematic look. So uh, 24 frames a second is definitely um, highly, highly recommended to get those those uh, those good shots. Absolutely. Um, yep. 24 frames per second, rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also, I'm actually also going to add, uh, add to that, you know, making sure that your drone settings are really set to smooth settings. You know, there's, of course, there's a lot of different drones. I know a lot of people are familiar with Skydio, a lot of people are familiar with, um, you know, Autel, DJI. Um, uh, but within those apps, you actually have the, the opportunity to change the settings on how smooth you fly, how fast you fly. 
Um, so yeah. those are going to be some of the, the super detailed things that we're going to walk through. But but yeah, I would say frames per second. Keep that in mind. Your rule of thirds, is, I would say, is probably top priority. Your histogram to control those colors. And then, of course, your flight setting. This is how smooth your drone is yawing or turning or ascending or descending or flying in a certain uh, fly, flying in a certain direction. This is all, these all, all of these used together will um, be added up to give you as close to that cinematic um, look um, as possible. Yeah, and even you know how fast the, the gimbal is you know going up and down um, and, and changing direction. I mean, if you're going if you're changing direction very quickly and, and it's kind of that fast jerky motion, that's going to reflect, you know, on your footage. It's always about smooth, slow it down, be as smooth as possible. And again, um, all these settings are in um, um, in the in the DJI. I um, want to talk a little bit about the money shots, right? I mean, these are the shots that like guarantee to get views. Get yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, when you go out and you capture it, yeah, that's, you know, that's it. That's, you know, you know, as soon as you see it and, um, uh, you, you've had a number of, of, uh, iconic, you know, shots, one of my, one of which I'll put on my, my IG today, but yeah, maybe you want to talk us through, and I do have some examples that I'll share as well as you're talking through these, but yeah, what are some of these, yeah, what is your personal, what's in your personal bag? Absolutely. I mean, you're going out and you know, absolutely going to be, yeah. That's a really good question, man. Really good question. And, you know, that 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 also goes back to kind of planning. You know, I, I know before I kind of say, hey, OK, I want to go, you know, uh, hiking somewhere this weekend. I want to I want to go. I want to go hiking in Maryland and um, or actually better yet. Sorry, I want I want to go to Lion's Head in South Africa. And, um, you know, I used you know, if, if if I was a drone pilot just starting out, I would just go put my drone up and. Okay, I'll take a video of this. Okay, let me go over here. Oh, that's a nice picture. Let me snap that. Oh, wait, you know, this looks really good. Let me fly back over here and get this video. And then what really starts to happen, you know, is like you waste battery and then you get home and you don't have any shots that you actually like or a lot of the shots look the same, right? So in terms of, you know, planning anywhere that I go, these are going to be the top uh, three shots that I get on any project. You know, whether I have a shot list, whether I, whether I don't, whether I'm shooting for myself or even shooting for B-roll or for, for, for production. But before I even show up at the site, I already know what I want to capture, what subject do I want to capture, and then what type of movements do I want to have. So I'll give you a little bit of a, a cheat sheet today. I'm going to talk about three of my favorite shots. Um, one is, number one is probably the easiest. It's called Just Fly Straight. Okay, just fly straight. That's it. No joystick moval. The only joystick that you're moving is probably on your right joystick, and you are just slowly pressing that forward or slowly pressing that back. So that shot is the money shot. You probably seen it. Anybody, um, you know, seen any movies or introduction shots where they're doing, um, you know, a, a slow kind of push in or push out? Um, can anybody give me an example of a movie that they saw recently where they had one of these kind of slow uh, pushing in shots in the chat? Any, any movies recently stick out to anyone as far as the aerial, this forward, straightforward shots? Mm-hmm. And while we're waiting on that video to load, maybe um, it may be a little uh, quicker for me just to pull it up on my end. Yeah, yeah, I can let, I can allow you to share. Let me see. Uh, okay, yeah. Let me just. Okay, so me. House of Dragon, of course, House of Dragon. Definitely a lot of CJI and definitely a lot of drones uh, being used on that set for sure. So that was a really good example. I saw Thor. Uh, kind of ISIS, uh, Jurassic Park movie. Yep, exactly. Definitely. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, right. So Jurassic Park, that, that, of uh, the movie is of course about the subject, the dinosaurs, but it's also about the environment and the Island that they're on. So that's going to be a great opportunity for a drone just to see the whole environment. 
and also share that in a, in a cinematic way. So let me see here. I'm going to click on, uh, let's see. Actually, let's do this. You can okay. share now, right? Am I sharing? Okay. Yeah, you can share, yeah. Cool. All right, actually, let me bring the folder up real quick. My bad. And while he's doing that, I think we did have a question. Um, so Sulin asked, uh, do you recommend to beginners just starting out on auto settings or learn manual ASAP um, for ISO, shutter speed, et cetera? Um, Good question. I, I, yeah, go ahead. But yeah, I, I was going to say in terms of, you know, that's one of the things I would talk about before actually getting the perfect shot and the perfect sunset, safety is first, right? So before we even talk about histogram and all of that, I want to make sure people that can actually fly safe. I want to make sure people can actually fly safely and confidently. So knowing how your drone moves, knowing the speed at which you should fly, making sure that you're comfortable with the sticks is going to be way more important than making sure that you can get up and get a quick shot. Um, so with that being said, Sulin, I would definitely recommend just fly it on auto just to begin. And then once you've got the mechanics of flying down, I think then. Um, slowly um, testing out both auto and manual settings, I think will really help you um, kind of learn more about your drone and learn, you know, what settings work, work best for you. The reason why I'm going to recommend manual settings every time for cinematography, for aerial cinematography, um, um, the reason, yeah, so, yeah, the reason, the reason why I'm going to, I'm going to recommend manuals because it just gives you more, um, ability to control the image from beginning to end. So things like auto white balance, ISO and auto, you don't have to worry about that. But in manual, you just have more ownership of, of the actual picture. Okay, so it looks like I can't share right now. Um, if you can give me oh. access, then I'll, I'll start sharing some uh, of those three shots okay. that I was going through. A major co-host, uh... It says cool next to your name. Let me see. Okay. So no worries. When you, when you click share, what happens? I'm seeing host disabled participant screen share. Hmm. Huh. All right. Maybe let me make you host. And let's see if that changes. Okay, right, cool. So I can see I'm the host now. I am going to share my screen. And then that uh, looks like it's host disabled participant screen sharing. So um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure what that means. It's but, um, like, I don't know. Sorry, what was that? Um, um, I was just trying to share. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, but maybe I know if you can bring those. Um, okay. Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. I am. Okay. Maybe I can do this. So computer audio, let's do that. All right. And let's try to share the screen now. Yeah, I'm still getting the same. Um, I'm still same getting the same. Uh, disabled screen, but I know just to make sure that we can move on because uh, we're right at five o'clock right now. Can you just open um, at least one or at least get a uh, fly straight orbit and then the other shot and I can just talk, talk through those. Um, I won't kind of waste our time talking about the straight forward because it's pretty basic. It's literally composing your shot and flying straight forward. I really recommend that because in any movie, in any show, uh, from Insecure to uh, Black Panther 2 or even House of Dragons. Um, entry shots, extra shots, even to move the story along, you're just simply flying your drone in a straight line. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, the uh, next shot you, that I'm going to share, and if you can bring up and have that start loading, is called the parallax shot. So I'm going to say that this shot is more of an intermediate level, it, but you're going to choose a side to fly. So let's say I want to, my subject is in the middle. 
and I want to fly from left to right, what I'm going to do is fly my drone left to right, but I'm going to pan right. So if I'm flying left, I'm going to pan right. And if I'm flying right, this is probably backwards since I'm on video. If I'm flying right, I'm going to pan left. And it gives you a really, really cool parallax feel where it actually looks like the subject is still, but the background is moving. So Anna, let me know if you've had any luck bringing up some of those, um, some of those uh, clips. And you yep. can share your screen again when you're ready. I have one loading now, but um, I think you actually need to make me a co-host again. Or host. Okay. Participants, and then um, how do I do that? How Or how do I make you a... Uh, so next to my name, it should be some dots. And uh, let's see, let's see. Yeah, it was three dots, and then yeah, it should say make host, make host. All right, make. Okay, I am not seeing the three dots yeah. next to your name. I see chat, and then I see high non-video participants. Okay, okay, let's see. Um, Let me just, maybe I can uh, remove myself. Or I could just leave. <laughs> Let me leave one of my one of my um okay, so I'm gonna be on my cell phone now. I'm not sure if you can take over the meeting. Uh yeah, we'll likely pass it back to okay, make colors boom. Okay, I had to do it for my cell phone. All right, there we go. Mm, All right, okay. So if you could bring some of those shots up real quick. I know we're a little bit past time, but I want to get through those three real quick. Yes. All right. Okay, cool. So I'm the host now. And let me make. All right, cool. Okay. Okay. So with that being right. said, while Adam's looking at that up, you know, one of the things I preface before getting into these shots is before showing up, no matter where I'm going, whether I'm driving 20 minutes down the street or 2000 miles away from home, I'm always trying to think about the subject in which I wanna shoot and then try to just imagine what are the shots that I know I wanna get, right? What are the shots, whether it's a parallax, whether it's a, a, a forward motion or whether it's a moonwalk, which I call it, but what are the shots that I wanna get both for video and for photo? So I think we do have the parallax shot here. You all see the screen? We're still loading. And what we're also gonna do is um, we're, we definitely will recap uh, the session today and we'll put in links to these specific shots um, so that you can all see you know, what we were referring to. And um, yes, yeah, so you can just really just have it at your disposal anytime you wanna go into you know, check out what these sample shots look like. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do, yeah, I think we'll just put the links in there since yeah, we're having some issues with the sharing. All good, all right, so maybe just do, just do a quick recap on those shots so they know what to expect once we send the links to them. What are those shots that you listed up? Sure thing, yeah, so first shot number one is just, just fly straight. That's where you have your drone level and you're just pushing that right, right joystick slightly forward and you get a nice hand in shot. So just fly straight number one. The second shot that I'm gonna recommend and that I always try to get is a parallax shot. And I choose a direction. If I'm flying right, I'm gonna pan left with my left joystick, depending on how you have your control set up. If I'm flying left, I'm gonna pan right. 
and focus on the subject. So that's the parallax effect. And the really cool thing about that is you get this cool effect where your subject is kind of standing still and then everything else in the background is spinning. And then the last, uh, excuse me, that's, that's the, uh, sorry, that's the parallax shot. And then the last is the orbit shot. And that's simply, with a lot of these drills nowadays, you have these really cool autonomous flight modes. Scouting was one of my favorites, but it's literally picking a subject, whether that subject is a building or whether that subject is even you. If you're walking on vacation or you're with your family or on the beach, riding your bike, AT, whatever it is, the drone is actually circling around you as you are moving. So it creates this really, really, really um, kind of mind blowing effect that, you know, you're, you're, you are right in the middle and everything else is spinning around. Slightly a little bit different than that parallax shot because there's a little, there's a 360 movement. Um, but in terms of the final shot, orbit shot, I would say is one of my favorites. That's actually what I use a lot of on my personal content when I'm traveling or I'm by myself or I'm solo traveling. Uh, but highly recommend those three. Just fly straight, the parallax, and the orbit shot. Awesome, awesome. Um, so want to move quickly. I know we're um, we're getting close to our time, and please, uh, we're going to answer all the questions that you have. Feel free to ask them in the chat. But I did want to ask about, of course, um, video editing, right? Because I know that's a big, big deal. Some people um, find it a little too complicated. Some people love it. Um, I'll tell you my personal history, you know, with editing. Um, I actually yeah. started to do a lot of editing um, in the beginning. And uh, hello? Can you hear me? Oh, I think, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I did a lot of editing um, in the very beginning, actually from my phone. And um, because I remember looking at you know, uh, Adobe Premiere, and I was really just um, uh, overwhelmed, right? And I was very overwhelmed with uh, what it took to actually put together uh, this full, you know, video. And it, it is very involved. Anyone who's ever sat down with Adobe Premiere, um, that's actually my, my limit as far as anything on desktop. I don't get into After Effects. Um, I kind of set my, my limits. And Another thing that I noticed is, you know, editing is, is very time consuming. Um, those of you who, you who edit your own projects are very time consuming. So I've actually gotten to the point now where I'm outsourcing a lot of my work and it has saved me so much time because, you know, there literally be whole days where, you know, you're probably going to be sitting somewhere for six, you know, eight hours editing, you know, one video. And um, in the very beginning, I didn't have the fact ask this, you know, uh, a processor, you know, to, to work on and, and the video was, um, you know, it, it was an issue. So um, all that to say is, you know, think about the time that that you take to edit. It can be very fun. And uh, I still edit, you know, my own personal, uh, you know, videos and any kind of leisure things that I do. But most of the time it's just business related at this stage that I am, um, I definitely outsource, you know, most of that. Um, but yeah, you know, I did want you to just touch on how you approach how you approach video video editing in the very beginning, and then how you actually got better, you know, over time. What did that whole transformation kind of look like? Yeah, video editing in the beginning. Wow. So when I first started traveling, um, not only did so not only did I buy a drone in the in a DJI Osmo, but I also bought um, like a i five MacBook Pro. And uh, man, by the time I started trying to render those 4K files, you could probably uh, cook jollof on the laptop. I mean, it, it was it was so it was just incredibly hot. Um, so what I learned from that was more than anything, yes, you need the tools to be able to process your images, especially now when these drones are shooting like 4K and 2.1K. These are pretty big files. Um, but I would say the biggest thing for me in terms of editing is actually the organization, the content management, the asset management of the file. I mean, you gotta think about it, right? I started traveling full time in November, 2018. I didn't stop, literally did not stop for a year and a half. Um, I don't think I had more than two weeks. I was, I was anywhere. I was literally all around the world. 
And what happens is, you know, when you travel so much, you're recording so much content, it may seem easy just to uh, record it. I'll just put it on this disc and no date or, I'll, you know, I'll just put, you know, Asia or something and get to it. But what saved me the most time in editing is organizing my files, having a formal um, month, date, location. So whether it's something that I shot in Zimbabwe um, for a hotel three weeks ago, or it was something I shot two years ago in Zambia. If somebody were to call me and say, hey, Ime, um, I need a photo of uh, Linda Community School that you took on the third day of camp. I can get there in about three clicks. And of course, as opposed to trying to search through thousands and thousands of files of, of, uh, of drone shots and, and camera shots and different cameras that I use, it would literally be impossible. Um, I tell that story because there was one point where I actually had a brand uh, that reached out to me and they needed a video asset from Ghana to use. They wanted to license that, that video um, in, in, a, in a promotional marketing video. So when you talk about license, this, this is a lot of money. And I think they made the request on Monday. I told them I would get it later that day. And I promise you, I could not find that clip of, of the Memorial Center in Accra. Um, so not only did I lose the opportunity to, to help someone, to provide them content, to you know, help them share their story, but I also lost a potential business contact. I lost a, probably a, uh, an opportunity to even travel back to Ghana you know, to do commission work. So I know we're talking about editing. Most people think about Premiere Pro and, and all these things. But for me, I think the biggest win for me was organizing my footage in a way that, you know, I'm in a place right now, you know, coming up on 2022, my reel, I'm going to be able to put that together probably in about two hours, just because I know exactly where my best shots are from everywhere that I've traveled, even in Premiere Pro. I've been creating the time I throughout this whole year of only my best shots. Um, so I do have some resources on that. I can't wait to share with this group, but organization more than anything when it comes to editing, that's going to save you time. And of course, time is money. Absolutely. And that actually kind of segues perfectly to our next topic, which is, you know, that passive income. And uh, I know a lot of people are wondering, you know, how can I create uh, passive income with a drone, um, all this footage that you're that you're taking and that you that you own, that's rightfully you know your footage that you took. Um, yeah, what does passive income look like? How do you set it up? And how can you know people on the call here today also you know set up their own uh, passive income with drones? Really great question, man. So passive income, I think you know as 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 I've gone throughout even my professional career. And I've even gone to now creative entrepreneurship. Passive income is your best friend. Um, my first experience of passive, I'll get to drones in a second, but my first experience of passive income, I was working at Expedia in Seattle. Um, yeah, I was comfortable, you know, comfortable with my salary, but I was always taught to just have multiple things just working in the background. It's okay to have your salary, but hey, a couple extra 200, 300 a month. It's definitely not going to hurt you take care of whatever bills. But I started my passive income journey um, with T-shirts. I would literally design T-shirts in Canva. I would upload those T-shirts to my merch store on Amazon. Um, I had no inventory. Um, and I would sell T-shirts. And this, you know, would attribute since then, I mean, at least, you know, $600, $700 a month where, and here's, here's the point. Here's the golden nugget. I did something once. I created a design once and I uploaded it and put it in, and put it online. And now it has the ability to make money for me forever. I'm gonna repeat that again. I did something once, I created something once, I put it online once, and now it has an opportunity to make money for me forever. That is passive income. That is making money in your sleep. I'm not saying that your passive income side hustle has to be 10K, 12K a month. But that little three, 600, 700, 800, it adds up. It could be a bill that you can knock off. It could be a, a school loan. It could be a car note. It could be investing in your next drone. Here's where we come to drones. And I'm going to wrap this in because I know people are probably confused. But with stock footage, I remember watching uh, HBO. 
um, Issa Rae's Insecure. And I remember, uh, of course, it's a great show. Shout out to Issa Rae. Um, and I would notice, and this is about a year, you know, to me started flying. I'm like, hey, every time they transition between scenes, I'm seeing drone shots. And I want to give you guys homework tonight. If you're going to sit down, you know, with your loved ones, watch some TV tonight, turn on a movie and let me know how many drone shots you start to notice. Whether it's the intro scene, right? It, it's uh, with, with something we, we just went to see Woman King um, two days ago for my birthday. And the first shot is just, you know, this is taking place in the, the ancient kingdom around Benin. And you're seeing this shot of what we're assuming to be the continent of Africa, right? So the whole point of this is, as drone pilots, content is queen, all right? It's no longer king. Content is queen. So you have to have content to run your business. And you have to have, you almost have to have content to tell you a story. As a drone pilot, the last three weeks I spent in Zimbabwe, I'm collecting nothing but stock footage. Nothing but stock footage of Victoria Falls, Nothing but stock footage of the landscapes, of the animals, and things like that. We'll talk about how I did that legally um, in the future. But nonetheless, I'm taking stock footage, a 10-second clip of Victoria Falls, and then I upload that on a stock footage site. And the goal is anytime a production studio or a movie or even a business needs some content that revolves around um, Zimbabwe or Victoria Falls or Livingstone or wherever, or even natural, land, natural landscapes, my clip will be there. And every time somebody downloads that clip, I get a check in the mail. So think about it. I shot this clip once, right? I uploaded it to a website. I use blackblocksglobal.com. I'll include this in the notes. But blackblocksglobal.com, they'll, they'll put that on Getty Images. They'll put that on Adobe. They'll put that on Shutterstock. They'll put that even on Pond5. A lot of people are familiar with Canva. You start to see those stock videos there. Those are all stock footage that somebody had to shoot. So this drone has, again, become a way of just printing money. Now, are you going to retire off of stock footage? Probably not. Or you're going to have to shoot a lot of footage. But again, passive income. The, you know, especially for now, I've been shooting a lot with the Mavic 3 this whole year, uploading my stock footage consistently. It's a guaranteed thousand dollars per month for me. That's just in my back pocket that I can use to pay for business, that I can use to pay for ads for my own business, that I can use to invest in myself or whatever it is may be. But that passive income just allows me to have cushion every month by literally, literally doing nothing. I shot a clip once. I uploaded it. It now has an opportunity to make me money as long as the internet is available. And I'm going to put my money in that the internet is going to be available for a very long time, um, at least for my lifetime. So again, getting into that point of not just stock footage, but even if I take a picture um, of Victoria Falls uh, with a photo of my drone, I can actually sell that as a print. I can put that picture on a t-shirt. I could put that picture on a hat. I can put that picture on a notebook. There are so many tools that allow you just to take an image or a digital file and upload that to a mug or a calendar. Or, I mean, I, I even know drone pods that have sold some of their photos as background, as screensavers for other people's computers. Um, so there's just so many ways that um, you can use the content that comes from your drone um, and really use that to your benefit. Yes, it will take a little bit of work up front, but luckily um, there are virtual assistants out there. There are, there's Fiverr, there's Upwork that you can actually commission and uh, there's TaskRabbit that you can actually say, hey, I just came back from Texas. I just came back from San Diego. Um, let's say you're Angela out there and I have a bunch of footage and I just want to get it up on the stock site. I don't want to edit it. I don't want to color grade it. I just want to send you the files and upload it for me. You can actually do that and split commission with the curator. So, so many, when it comes to content, there's just so many opportunities uh, to, to create passive income and stock footage for me in the past, I would say two years, two and a half years that I've discovered stock footage 
um, it, it's by far the easiest way to make money with your drone. Awesome. Awesome. There you have it. You know, stock footage and we've all, all seen it. We've all maybe even used it, you know, at some point. Um, but if you think about it, you know, drone stock footage is still relatively new. I mean, even if you go search for that footage, stock footage in Nigeria, I mean, how many clips are you going to find, right? So if you're a drone pilot here, you have clips, you know, nice, very high quality clips, put them online, you know, put your best clips online and just let it sit there. I mean, literally, I mean, I've done the same for Shutterstock, um, four or five years ago. And, you know, every now and then you'll get a little, you know, get a little check here and there, but I also stopped uploading a lot of footage. Now, the few hundred dollars I have made from stock footage, if I would have kept, you know, uploading and kept doing that, then who knows you know, where it could be now, but yeah, the opportunity is out there. Sam Jakes Roberts is here and sharing. Uh, I think someone needs to be on. Sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, no, it's, it's one of those ways that, you know, to, and, I, and I talk to a lot of drone pilots, you know, all over the world, any, any, anywhere that I go, whether it's for a shoot or personal time, I always try to connect with drone pilots. And it's actually quite shocking to me how many drone pilots or creatives just don't know about stock footage. You know what I mean? It's, I, I understand, you know, whether you're video production or for, you just like fly it as a hobby. Um, but the whole point of this is if you go on vacation to Hawaii and you're there for five days, and let's just say, well, you know, two out of the five days, you decide to wake up early in the morning and go down to the beaches in Maui or go to Waikiki, wherever it is, and fly your drone, you know, get a bunch of 10, you know, seven to 10 second clips. You can come back home, put those, uh, put that stock footage online. And you may not see the results immediately, right? But coming back maybe six months, nine months, a years from now, you know, we're talking about time. That drone footage, that drone shot, you know, depending on the quality and how good it is and how many times it's downloaded, it can actually pay for your vacation, right? It may not pay for it at that time, but certainly, you know, uh, accumulating, you know, um, you know, download after download after download you know, every clip is going to be different. I would say for most of my drone clips, I'm getting anywhere from about fifty to seventy dollars, and these are seven second clips, seven second clips, right? So just imagine over time, or even if you have multiple downloads per day, or even let's say for example, um, as soon as Christmas lights go up here in Baltimore, you damn right I'm going to be outside, you know, getting drone shots of Baltimore with Christmas lights. Because next year, people might want to use that. You know, WJZ or local Baltimore news station may want to use some stock footage of Baltimore during the winter. So again, I just want to get people in the way that, you know, this, it, it's, it can be a $2,000 toy if you make it, right? But if you want to make it a tool to be able to travel, to grow your business, to see the world, there's certainly ways to do that. Um, I've been doing that for the past three years and I'm really looking forward to, you know, just releasing some gems because there's some super talented individuals out there, drone pods, creatives, entrepreneurs that, um, you know, are, have really good footage. And I'm just like, man, this looks really great on Instagram, but I'm more than certain that clip could be making money for you in the background you know, while you're, while you're traveling or at your day job or whatever it may be. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think that's like a whole kind of like mini course on itself. Right. I mean, just being able to understand uh, the concepts. But I think one thing that you touched on is outsourcing the work, right. You don't have to look at this as like, Oh, I have to go through, you know, all of my clips and, and things like that. I mean, this is something that you can definitely have a VA help you on not too expensive expensive, you know, find on Fiverr, find on Upwork, um, you know, pay, pay some small amount of money to have your footage yep. up there. And now yep. you're set up, you know, yep. for the future. So, yep. um, absolutely. Um, all right. So we're kind of running on um, our time for today, but I do have just two, two more topics. And in the meantime, um, if you guys have any uh, questions or anything like that you want to answer, this is now the time to ask those questions. Um, 
And one of the topics um, as we uh, start to wind down, I actually wanted to ask you about your uh, accessories, right? Because when, you, when you're traveling, of course, you're not just bringing, um, you're not just bringing just the drone alone, right? There's other accessories um, and, you know, a, a few that I can actually personally recommend, um, you know, you definitely want to have like a takeoff and landing pad um, in case you're in, in, in any kind of dusty or, um, uh, you know, just, you know, hard terrain um, areas. The last thing you want is sand and dust and dirt getting into your drone and getting into the motors and, and really messing up, um, you know, how the drone operates. So um, take off and landing pads. Of course, if you're flying outside, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed that, you know, when it's very bright outside, you can barely see your phone screen, right? So having maybe like a hood or a shade that can help you see. Um, a lot of times I actually just, you know, find somewhere with some shade. Um, it also, you know, helps as well. Um, but yeah, even when you approach, you know, different accessories, I mean, what's in your bag, you know, when you leave, you know, the States to go to one of these countries, you know, what are, what are you kind of your must haves that you take with you? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that comes to mind, it, I'm trying to think of like the, the top three things, but, um, extra batteries, um, I would say extra batteries for sure. Um, memory card, it, it, it's almost a given, it's almost a given, uh, big enough memory card. Um, and then I would also say just a comfortable bag, you know, to keep your drone in, you know, these gimbals, a, a lot of the more expensive kind of the prosumer drones that are made today um, come with these three axis gimbals. And these gimbals are very, very sensitive. It's, it's kind of thick as, you know, think of your gimbal as, you know, essentially the spinal cord you know, to your drone, it's incredibly sensitive. And especially when you have a lot of luggage and, you know, it's being tossed around and, you, you know, you're going a long way, there is potential for that to be damaged. So I would definitely say at number three, making sure that you have um, uh, the right packaging, not just throwing, you know, I don't care if it's a mini two or mini three or whatever, how small it is, but making sure that you're protecting your drone in your bag is, is absolutely essential. Obviously having multiple batteries, um, you know, if, if you're going on vacation, you know, more or less, you know, depending on where you're going or how you travel, you're probably going there once, right? So you got a little bit of pressure to, you know, in this, you know, window, you know, you have to get these shots, but certainly making sure that you have enough battery um, is, is a major key. And then, of course, um, memory, you know, having a memory card that's going to be big enough to capture everything and save it not only save it from the capture, but also back it up is huge, 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 huge. You never want to, you know, fly 5,000 miles across the world and you pull out your drone just to realize that there's no memory card in that. That has happened to me once. It was a very, uh, very tough conversation with the client. I, I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll say that. Um, but yeah, making sure that you have memory, battery, and then of course, making sure that you're always protecting your equipment with a really good bag, a travel bag. Yeah, I, mean, I can imagine that. That is probably explaining to the client. I mean, yeah, I can remember a time where, yeah, you know, showing up and uh, the batteries aren't charged. <laughs> you know, so what do you what do you do then, right? So just make sure you are again planning, 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 planning for your trips, for your shots, making sure you have enough battery, making sure you have enough memory cards, so you're not rushing through your shot that's actually one of my the things that i absolutely hate right when i'm out somewhere and it feels like i'm rushed to get that shot like i don't feel like i'm just kind of naturally just getting that shot and maybe someone's you know ready to leave or you know something like that but you don't want to be in this kind of antsy situation because you're never going to get the shot that you want you're just kind of shooting and just hoping that one of those clips you know is good enough but the more you plan have you won't be jittery you won't be you know thrown off track you're going to look at your shot list i don't know if we talked you know much about a shot list outside of those um those key shots but yeah planning um is very very key um looks like we have a couple questions that have come in um so wiz the kid wants to know what website did you mention for stock footage nice okay so that website is there, there's a couple but the one that I've used and the one that I've um, found most successful is um, blackbox.global, blackbox.global. 
and we can put that in the chat. Um, but yeah, so the great thing about Black Box is that you upload it once and then we'll actually um, distribute your drone clips or even if you have, I've even sold actually clips from my digital camera, but drone clips are obviously very popular. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's actually free. I mean, you, they take their commission, um, you know, kind of based on what the clip is sold for, but, um, yeah, it, it's all you, there's, there's, it's free to sign up. There's a guide that, that helps you. Um, there's curators, there's a Facebook group. Um, now, of course you can always, you know, upload directly to Getty's images or Shutterstock or Premiere Pro, or, excuse me, not Premiere Pro, uh, but Pond5. But the great thing about Black Box Global is that it's going to do all of that for you. Awesome. Uh, next question we have, uh, or I guess it's a comment from Stu Lynn. Yes, ND filters. And yes, they're essentially, uh, think about them as sunglasses. Um, actually, yeah, I don't think we specifically mentioned ND filters. Yeah, so if you want to maybe quickly touch on, um, yeah, the, the importance of ND filters, because actually that's, that's really a, a, a big thing too, right? Besides, um, you know, how you mentioned the, how the rule of thirds totally changed, you know, how you shot and the quality. I would say for me, finally using ND filters, I was like, I don't know how I haven't, you know, used them before. So yeah, maybe a quick word on the importance of them and why everyone should have a set of ND filters. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, just, you know, just like Sulin mentioned, ND filters are essentially sunglasses for your drone. So, you know, big surprise, usually when you're flying a drone, the sun is out, you know, you're, you're outside during the day. And a lot of the times, because these sensors are so small on the camera, um, they're really uh, they, they're really not built for, you know, capturing a lot, a lot of light. So instead of just kind of manually exposing your camera like this, what you can do is put on a, this is an ND filter, uh, for the Scotty 2 Plus. They're all built uh, differently. Uh, but what you can do is actually put these sunglasses on. And what that would allow you to do is um, you won't have to bump up your ISO or reduce your shutter speed to let in more light. What this will actually do, going back to the histogram, which is super important, will actually, um, what an ND filter will do is it was, it's going to do its best to sort of level out the whites and the blacks in your photo to give you um, just a really clean, um, exposed image. So next time anyone flies, I want you to look at, there's going to be two numbers that are going to be towards the bottom of your screen. Um, usually they start around 0.0. .0. You might see negative 0 0.3 or plus 3.0. That is your exposure. What ND filters are there to do is to make sure that your ex your image can be correctly exposed as, as possible. ND filters are typically used during the day. Um, and what they will do is reduce the amount of sunlight coming into your camera to give you the best uh, po possible images. But, excuse me, to give you the best possible image. And then another thing is along with ND filters, because we're usually flying in motion, what ND filters will help do is actually create motion blur. And motion blur is, I guess the, the simplest way to describe it is if you shake your hand about a foot away from your face, you'll see that you're not actually seeing your fingers individually, but you're actually seeing a blur. And our eyes are used to seeing this, that's motion blur. And what ND filters do is allow your drone um, to essentially mimic your eyes in terms of that motion blur whether you're passing a building or you're passing a car with your drone, um, ND filters uh, give you uh, more of that cinematic effect. Awesome. We're getting some true, true nuggets here today. Appreciate all the all the value that's being shared. Um, just a couple of questions. Ellison, please, please, if you have questions, keep them coming. This is our, our Q&A section. So we have a question from uh, Christopher. How many flight hours did you get before you mastered it? And do you insure your drone? Mm, wow, man, I, hours, I, I, don't, I still don't feel like I'm mastered yet. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm still trying things every day. Um, 
and I haven't even learned how to fly FPVs yet. So that 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 it, it's it's a long journey. And to be honest, that's one of the things as an art as an artist, you know, you really never stop trying to learn. I know for me, um, there's you know more and more clients asking for more and more dynamic shots. You know, um, not everything has to be from 400 feet. You know, most of my drone shots nowadays are probably 100, 100 feet off the ground, really getting closer to the subjects and just showing it from a different perspective. You know, just because you have a drone doesn't mean you need to fly, you know, 8,000 feet in the air. A lot of the times, you know, there was a shot, I shot a wedding in Columbia last month and, you know, a lot of my favorite shots from that one were about 30 feet off the ground. You know, it really wasn't this huge kind of, you know, super just see everything, but it was really the details, you know, in the bridal's dress or the crowd or the actual venue that I was able to get, uh, you know, at, a, at about at about 50 feet. Um, and in terms of insurance, absolutely. Uh, because a lot of the, uh, my, my professional work or my, the, the work that's commissioned uh, by my agency, um, it is required uh, that we have insurance on most of these shots. So yes, my jaws are insured, my camera equipment is insured. Um, in, in any event of any liability or disaster or things like that, um, having both my Part 107 and insurance um, for my drones and also business insurance is 100% required. Um, you know, in the different projects that you work with, you're going to be using, sometimes you're going to use a little bit more expensive equipment. And of course, as a business owner, you want to make sure that um, it's, it's insured and so that you can just keep everyone safe. Uh, around you absolutely and just a quick quick uh pro tip on the insurance um of course there's um options that you have from dji you know care refresh and we definitely recommend you uh take advantage of uh the manufacturers you know uh, warranties and and um things that they have in place for you and if you are interested in business of course uh it's required you know for you to have insurance um all right next up which brand of uh, which model dji is much affordable and suitable for a beginner who wants to become a drone pilot yeah um there's a lot of drones to choose from <laughs> and um i think if you're on the career path or creative career path of you know doing more aerial cinematography or videography or if you want to work on movie sets or even if you want to tell stories, you know, about your, um, you know, your own neighborhood, I think uh, DJI certainly has some great, you know, prosumer, when I say prosumer, professional slash consumer, um, but I think DJI has some great uh, prosumer drones. What I really like about DJI is that um, really good, uh, really great camera quality, um, really nice portability with a lot of their uh, prosumer drones. And then the learning curve is really easy. Um, I know that doesn't answer your question, but if I was just getting started today, um, I and you know, and cost was a factor, I would actually still buy the Mini Two. Um, the Mini Two is going to be a great drone to learn with, um, to just get you know uh, familiar with your controls, being able to look down at the controller and then up at the drone. Um, the only thing about the DJI Mini 2 is that it does not have obstacle sensing. So if you head towards that tree, you're going too fast, the drone is going to hit the tree. It's not like the Skydio 2 Plus where you have all of these, you know, obstacle sensing radars around the drone. This, this drone will actually stop itself. Um, but if I was a beginner, um, if I was starting over today and I was looking for a cost-effective drone, I think DJI Mini 2 is probably under... Um, uh, 500 bucks for just a drone. I will highly rec recommend the DJI Mini 2. Again, you know, anytime you're spending less than $400 on a drone, um, it, it's it's it, it, it's really the practice to fly. You know what I mean? Um, I don't think you're really going to find, uh, at least I have not found any drones um, under $300 that I would feel comfortable um, you know, even using on my portfolio or, you know, even pitching, you know, pitching work. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, um, but I, I would say, you know, if you want to start out, you know, start with that DJI Mini 2, it, I think that'd be good. What do you think, Eno? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say um, there are no drones under, you know, three, four hundred dollars that's going to give you a professional shot. And it's a question that we get asked all the time, right? What is the best beginner drone? But then also budget wise, you know, which which you should be prepared to spend. So, yes, as you may mention, the, the mini two, um, you could get, uh, yeah, for about four or five hundred bucks, um, even the mini one. Let's say you're not even really trying to go full professional off the bat, you can find an original mini for probably 300, 350, you know, bucks right now. Um, so I, one, one thing I always say is just get traction, right? Just get, just get your foot in the door. You don't have to start off getting, you know, the Skydio 2 Plus or the Mini 3 or anything, any flashy drone that you've seen out there, just get started. Get some traction, practice, you know, get some shots. And then once you make some money, you get some jobs, then you can step up to, you know, the latest drone. But don't don't think that that's a barrier to entry because you feel like you have to, you know, get a get a thousand two thousand dollar drone off the bat. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say right, that, and I, I don't yeah, want to confuse I don't want to confuse people, but you know, and and I know we'll talk about this and a lot of the you know the content that's going to be coming up towards the end of the year, but you know we're recommending drones right now that may not be remote ID compliant by this time next year. So I would just say like continue to make sure that you're signed up um, for this, you know, Global Air University tips and tricks, because these are the type of kind of nuances and, you know, FAA regulation, um, things that you should know, so you can make the right purchasing decision, right? So I won't get into the remote idea or what it is today, um, but essentially as we move forward and as we go into the future and as Walmart, you know, starts to use airspace and Amazon starts to use airspace for deliveries, there are going to be certain rules and regulations that are applicable to the United States. I'll, I'll preface that to the United States in terms of where you can fly, how you can fly, and of course, which type of drones you can fly. So I would say within the next couple of months, guys, there's going to be a lot, uh, guys and gals, is going to be a lot changing. Uh, but the best thing that you can do right now, is no matter what level of drone pilot, is to make sure that you're signing up uh, for the Global Air University newsletter. And this is going to give you business tips, creative tips, um, and even, if applicable in the United States, FAA uh, regulation tips and things that you should just know uh, before you take to the skies. Um, I'll, I'll be the first one to say it's like, I can sit here and talk about rule of thirds and histograms and ND filters all day, you know, in my opinion, having done this, you know, full-time professionally now for almost, you know, three years, flying safe is the best advice that I can give you. Because when you fly safe, when you're flying and you have peace of mind, your shots are going to be better because you are at peace. You are calm. You're not worried about flying illegally. You're not worried about you know, um, you know, somebody coming up and tapping you while you're trying to get this shot. When you fly safe, you will always, always, always get better shots. And beyond anything, you know, uh, with this content and the course and the materials and the guys that we give you, flying safe is always going to be the number one priority. Um, because when you fly safe and with peace of mind, um, it's a, it's it's a better flight experience, not just for you, but for everyone else around you. Absolutely, absolutely appreciate uh, appreciate that insight. And um, as as you may mention, you know we do want to get more information too. So I'm I'm going to assume most people here are signed up for our email newsletter. If not, um, please go to our website www.globalairu.com. I also just put in a link to our private uh, Facebook group. Um, it's only by invite, you know, only. Um, so if you want to network with other drone pilots from around the world, literally all around the world. Um, we're going to start sharing more content there, uh, networking, and, and really getting out best practices. So I really encourage you to, to join that. Just a few more questions um, as we are coming up on the last second. We're going to stop, uh, do a hard stop at the top of the hour. But we have a question from Angela. Um, would oh sorry, would you touch? Okay, would you touch on handling drone flying laws outside of the U.S.? Um, I can touch quickly on that and then um, you know, get email thoughts as well. Um, of course, I'm currently based in Lagos, Nigeria, um, a place where we don't actually have full regulations rolled out. So 
Um, I would say it's definitely country by country, right? Um, before you go to the country, um, you'll most likely want to look up and see whatever laws have been set up by the Civil Aviation Authority in that country. Um, there are a number of websites that you can also go to for this information. Um, we will, we are planning a, a huge database as well, but I know um, our friends at UAVcoach.com, they have a pretty good database of drone laws in other countries. And then also uh, there's a website and a group called the African Drone Forum. Um, if you go to africandroneforum.org, you will see there that they also have a, a global database of different laws and regulations. Um, you'd be surprised, you know, how, how simple it can be um, to, to receive a, a hobby permit or a, a, a normal commercial permit. Um, we were just in Zimbabwe, uh, Ime and myself on a, a project and um, I was able to use, you know, the CAA um, to receive, to, to have a, um, a permit for, for Ime to bring in his, his drones in the country. I mean, and, and, you know, I was expecting, well, really the paperwork did, you know, take a little bit of time, but that day that, you know, you came in, I was expecting you to be, you know, they're searching through all the bags and all your equipment and he just handed them a piece of paper and they, they, they let him go. So it's really just having the paperwork in place, planning, again, planning, planning, planning is, is, is key. And um, just knowing the rules and regulations uh, before you go. I will say that having your FAA Part 107 carries a lot of weight in other countries, especially if that country does not have any existing rules and regulations. Um, they will likely recognize that license um, uh, in, in other countries. So. Um, those are just some of the quick tips. And to be honest, even for Zimbabwe, because that was more of a leisure, um, we did have some leisure, you know, built in there. And um, we submitted a, a trust, trust certificate from the FAA. Um, so that was really all that they needed to be able to um, say, hey, all right, you guys are fine to, to come in, you know, with your drone. So, um, yeah, uh, hopefully that answers it. But every, unfortunately, every country is different. Um, and the last thing you want to do is get your drone seized at the airport. So definitely. Yeah, that's something um, happened to me. So Andrew, mm -hmm. a really good question. And this, this is for everybody, you know, whether, um, I, I, I know, you know, in the US, the, the, the federal, federal laws are um, applicable. Of course, there's going to be some spaces in the US, so, you know, if you live by an airport or if you're living there, you know, even in, you know, we're near DC here. So if I'm probably going 10 minutes down the road, White House is not having that. They're like, no drones, we don't even care. No drones whatsoever. 400 feet, 100 feet, four feet, your drone can't even take off. But yeah, so Amanda, just to, uh, excuse me, Angela, just, just to wrap that up. Um, yes, a simple Google search. Hey, I'm going to, um, I'm going to El Salvador. And a simple Google search, is it, a, is it legal to fly drones in El Salvador? You'll probably get one of those UAV coach links that's safe to click on. A lot of times they will have links to the actual aviation authority for that country where you will get the you know specifics. Um, but one of the things don't ever, uh, the one of the things I would say is don't ever assume because drone laws, drone, drones are still fairly new. So that means a lot of the laws are still changing. So some of these laws may be updated weeks ago or even months ago. So um don't be like me. Don't get your drone confiscated in Morocco, uh, you know, showing up, not fun. Again, another client project. I did not do my research. I thought I was, you know, about to get some sand dune shots and all these amazing shots. I got to the airport. They asked to search my bag. Uh, I didn't see my drone for about a week. Luckily, I got it back. But if I had done my research, um, it would have certainly saved me a lot of stress. And, and also to ex explain to my client that, hey, drones aren't allowed in Morocco. Um, so yeah, there are still gonna be some countries around the world where you know, drones are gonna be on the same level as drugs. They, they just do not allow it. And you, you can and will be arrested. Um, and you know, I would say even a fine is probably the least of your worries, but there's actual arrests that take place for people that operate drones um, or unmanned vehicles illegally. So trust me, the, the search that you do before, you know, you spend your money on vacation is going to be well worth it 
as opposed to just showing up and just assuming um, that, you know, another country's drone regulations are the same as they are in the U.S. or wherever your originating country or your home country is. Absolutely, absolutely. Very, very important tips. Um, we have a question from Malik. It was actually a really, really good question. Um, how do you plan your shots for an area you've never been to? Um, so a few things that, that immediately come to mind. Um, first of all, I would, I would probably start off by doing a simple uh, Google map search, right? Um, if you have the coordinates, if you have the address, uh, simply look up that location, look up that space and see what's what's around, you know, um, and sometimes you could even, um, yeah, you could do a 3D uh, look as well. So you can see if there's any tall buildings, any general, you know, vegetation that's around um, and really get a sense of what that area uh, looks like. Um, another thing, if you uh, take your FAA Part 107 exam, really any pilot's drone pilot's exam uh, or pilot, of course, in general, um, you're going to be expected to know about sectional charts, right? Um, sectional charts are essentially like an, a, a tool used in aviation to literally list out every single obstacle that a plane um, could, that could interfere with, you know, uh, aircraft. Um, it, it gives you coordinates. Um, it gives you locations of airports. It gives you locations of tall towers, electrical towers, you know, um, anything that's above a certain height um, that could potentially cause interference. Um, you absolutely uh, will we'll be on this chart. So it's a very, very complicated chart. It looks like, you know, if you've never seen a sexual chart before, you'll probably close the book when you see it because it is a lot of information there. But in order to be a licensed pilot, you have to know how to find different areas. So if you have a client that says, hey, I want you to come fly in this coordinate or this specific area. You literally can go there and see, are, am I five miles, you know, uh, from an airport? Because at that point, you'll need to actually get authorization to fly in that space. Or am I flying near a stadium? Or are there any other hazards around? So Google Maps, that's probably what I would first do. And if you can't find anything uh, specifically from there, um, I would look at the, a sectional chart for that area. But between those two, you should definitely be able to find out you know, exactly what the space looks like before you get there. Cool. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, man, like, I kind of feel like sectional, I, I don't, actually, I don't think I've ever seen a sectional chart in another country. I know they're there, but I know sectional charts are definitely going to be applicable to the U.S. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what a sectional chart is, it's essentially... You know how you have your um, highway road maps, and you can see like 95 or I 70 or two or whatever it is. It's the same thing, same kind of concept. It's just for an air map. So these are going to be for your helicopter pilots, your your skydivers, your hot air balloon vendors, your um, your blimp uh, guys, your um, even commercial airplanes. They're going to use this sectional chart to actually know when and where to fly. Um, if I'm taking it like, so for instance, in, in, in um, I went to Ghana in March to shoot for a nonprofit. And one of the things I did is, is a lot of what, and I'm on, I mentioned is going on Google, I actually use Google 3D maps. And it really allows me to get about maybe 100, 200 feet on the ground and actually see um, the place that I'm traveling to or the location um, at at least a close to a drone level um, as possible. So I would definitely use number one, Google Maps, Google Maps 3D, if you can get access to that. Um, the Before You Fly app is, is really applicable. It, is, it works really well here in the U.S. Um, a lot of times they will have more information about international destinations. Um, one of the um, other resources that I've used before going on a flight is actually DJI Fly Safe. So for instance, um, I just went to Columbia about three weeks ago. I was gonna fly my drone. I wanted to make sure that everything was fine. But I knew I also wanted to capture my hotel just to use that as, as, a, as a part of my content library. So um, just going into DJI, typing in the address of my hotel in an incognito window, of course. 
uh, feds watching. So um, I went to DJI, I put in the address of my hotel just to make sure that I can fly around my hotel. That's another thing. A lot of times people might stay toward or closer to the airport and you actually might be in the middle of an airspace or a landing strip or something like that. So it's always good to make sure whether it's your activities that you're gonna do, your ATV and your zip line, you're going for a hike or, you know, to the mountains. If you plan on using your drone there, what I would do is on your itinerary, have those addresses and just make sure just to do a sanity check. If you plan on flying your drone at those places, plug in that address to the DJI Fly Safe map and it will let you know if you need authorization or not, or if it's completely restricted. Um, so again, Google Maps, um, you can use uh, the Before You Fly app, which is a mobile app. Um, and then the DJI Fly Safe, it's actually a website and you, can, you should be able to access, access it on your mobile device, but you can literally put in your address um, and see around that area if there are or are not restrictions. So um, those are really good, from really good resources. I would also mention too, this is probably a bonus, but in terms of the creative shots, so yes, Googling the place. Um, let's say I want to go to, um, you know, let's say I'm going to uh, uh, South Abs, let's say I'm going to Johannesburg and I want to go to the Apartheid Museum and I want to, I want to make sure um, that I can fly. I can just literally, you know, plug that information in. I can see, okay, is it is it next to a highway? Is it next to, you know, moving cars? And it just allows me to really plan, um, you know, a lot a lot better, you know, for for my for my flight. So again, I'm not just showing up and you know lost. I'm actually going in there with a plan, so I can go in, get my shots, make sure that everyone is around me is safe make sure that I can find a place to take off that's safe and I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna endanger anybody around me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Tremendous value. We have one more question before we uh, close out this session. Uh, it's actually from Selena uh, joining us from Nairobi. And she's asking um, what kind of shots are recommended for real estate marketing? Um, you know, this is a question obviously near near and dear to I'm sure a lot of people here because, you know, real estate is actually the, the low hanging fruit for the industry and how a lot of us have actually gotten traction, gotten to the industry as well. Um, the shot that's actually sticking out to me is um, the orbit shot, right? Because, you know, you're able to, to see the entire home and you're, you're able to, to do a nice smooth um you know look at the entire property uh from that perspective uh, so that would definitely be one of the those money shots that we mentioned earlier um you know reveals um as well you know different you know pan ups and and um you know the elevation shot uh, one of the shots that we'll put into the the follow-up email as well um but honestly as, as far as shots i would just be looking at other examples that you really think are nice right uh one thing we always say is you know we're not we're not reinventing the wheel right so if you have a real estate video that's really stuck out to you like this is a phenomenal real estate video use those shots right <laughs> write down what those shots are what what how do they use those shots what do they do and that's really goes for anything that you see that you like it could be a shot of a a, a, a downtown you know type of area just take note of it, right? And just try to recreate it, like literally try to recreate it. So um, it's taking different nuggets from here. If you follow a good, you know, drone pilots that you like and the stuff that they do, look at what they're doing and try to recreate, you know, to a T um, what they're doing. But that will definitely uh, should, you know, set you up for some really nice, you know, real estate shots. And again, it's practice, practice, practice. Um, you're not going to get better unless you're literally going out there multiple times a week. Uh, running down your batteries, uh, not not all the way. There's a safe way to, to to do it. I wouldn't recommend anything below 20%. Just a rule of thumb, as you know, uh, uh, battery health. But um, go out and shoot as much as possible. That's that's what all of us did. Anyone who's who's gotten successful in this business, like I literally had my drone on my backpack everywhere I went. Right. 
Um, and uh, that's really how it has to be for you to get, you know, get to that level. Um, so, you know, with that, uh, this has been an amazing session. I really sincerely hope everyone has gotten some value from this, some nuggets. Um, I did just want to quickly on our way out, just mention that, you know, this isn't the last um, of any training like this. Of course, this is our free training, our, our free webinar that we're doing. Um, but we are planning to put together a full course um, that we will have Ime personally uh, teaching you all um, um, in a per like a small group cohort, you know, type of setting uh, to really go in depth, you know, in all these um, all these topics. So if you are looking to improve your quality, if you want, you know, someone to to give you personal tips, personal pointers on, you know, how you can improve or how you can expand your business, right? I mentioned the Drone Business Masterminds group as well. Um, if you're looking for ways to, you know, market or you may, may feel like, hey, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to have a good quality product. How do I get it out there? So reach out to us at any time. This is what we're here for, to help you, you know, grow, um, start and, and scale uh, your drone business. So uh, go to our um, Facebook page, uh, put there, uh, go to our website, follow our social media. We'll be doing a lot more of these uh, sessions. We'll be putting out a lot more content. And yeah, I look forward to, uh, you know, staying in touch with you all. And yeah, just really thank you so much for joining us. Ime, thank you so much for your time. Really, really, I, I learned, you know, a lot. And I we talk, you know, almost every day. And, uh, you know, I learned a whole lot from here. So uh, let's see, we have a few more. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. All right, yeah, thank you all. And, and yeah, we'll see you at the next training. And I will put this recording on our YouTube page um, and I will send that link to the email list. So yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. And uh, thanks again for, for joining. All right, have a good evening.